Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's TechSoup for Libraries webinar. Today's topic is Protecting Patron Privacy in Public Libraries. My name is Crystal, and I'll be your host. Patron privacy is of critical importance to libraries. It's included in the American Library Association's Code of Ethics and the Library Bill of Rights. As technology changes rapidly, libraries and librarians are working hard to keep up with digital security issues to better protect the privacy of their users. But this is not an easy task. Today we have two guests joining us to help us sort out some of these issues and share examples of solutions. We will focus on public access technology and focus on other related areas as well. Uh, before we begin, I have just a few announcements. We will be using the ReadyTalk platform for our meeting today. Please use the chat in the lower left corner to send questions and comments to the presenters. We will be tracking your questions throughout the webinar and will answer them at the designated Q&A section after each presenter. All of your chat comments will only come to the presenters, but if you have comments or ideas to share, we will forward them back out to the entire group. You don't need to raise your hand to ask a question. Simply type it into the chat box. Should you get disconnected during the webinar, you can reconnect using the same link in your confirmation email. You should be hearing the conference audio through your computer speakers, but if your audio connection is unclear, you can dial in using the phone number in your confirmation email or that we've shared here in the chat. If you're having technical issues, please send us a chat message and we will try to assist you. This webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the TechSoup website. If you're called away from the webinar or if you have connection issues, you can watch a full recording of this webinar later. You will receive an archive email within a few days that will include a link to the recording, the PowerPoint slides, and any additional links or resources shared during the session. If you're tweeting this webinar, please use the hashtag TS4LIBS. We have someone from TechSoup live tweeting this event, so please join us in the conversation there. TechSoup Global is dedicated to serving the world's nonprofit organizations and libraries. TechSoup was founded in 1987 with a global network of partners. We connect libraries and nonprofits to technology, resources, and support so that you can operate at your full potential, more effectively deliver your programs and services, and better achieve your missions. TechSoup has helped to distribute over 14 million software and hardware donations to date through our product donation program. We offer a wide range of software, hardware, and services that are both, both cost-effective and environmentally friendly. For more information about TechSoup product donations or services, please visit TechSoup.org and click on Get Products and Services. For today's webinar, we're joined by two guests. First up, we have Bill Buddington from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF. Bill will talk about digital security issues that impact patron privacy in public libraries and will share tools and information from EFF that can be useful for libraries. Then we'll hear from Chuck McAndrew, the IT librarian at the Lebanon Public Libraries in New Hampshire. He will share examples of actions he has taken at this small library to better protect patron privacy and to teach library users how to better protect their own privacy. My name is Crystal Schimpf, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Assisting us, us with chat, we have Becky Wiegand, and on Twitter we have Molly Bacon, both joining us from the TechSoup team. We'll have time again for Q&A after each presenter, and we'll be tracking your questions throughout. Uh, please share your questions in the chat as they arise. And lastly, we'll, we will be sending out an archive that will have all of the links shared during the session today, so you can uh, expect that in your email within a few days. All right. Well, without further ado, I think it's time for me to hand things over to Bill so he can talk to us about digital privacy and security. Bill? Hi there. Uh, thanks for joining me. I'm having some technical difficulties right now, actually. Um, so uh, one thing that I can do is, uh, Crystal, if you can advance my slides, um, and I can pull up a parallel set of slides. Um, on my side. Sorry, just one second. Thanks for bearing with us everyone as we uh, sort out this technical difficulty. We'll get started in just a moment. Okay. Um, so thanks so much for joining me uh, in this Digital Privacy and Security Library Edition. Next slide, who am I? And why should you listen to me? 
Um, my name is Bill Buddington. I am a, a security uh, a technologist and security uh, engineer at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I advise uh, lawyers and activists um, on uh, technical matters uh, as my primary day job. Next slide, what is EFF? Uh, EFF is the Electronic Frontier Foundation. We are a member-supported nonprofit. And we've been fighting for 26 years to promote privacy and civil liberties in the digital, digital world. We do this for basically a three, uh, with a three-pronged attack. We uh, have technologists on staff. We also have, uh, we have lawyers, and we also have uh, activists. And using these three uh, different teams at EFF, uh, we uh, have that mission of supporting your civil liberties in the digital world. Uh, so next slide. What is privacy and security, uh, and why is it important for librarians? Well, I'd like to start with this quote from Robert G. Vosper, uh, who was the head of the American Library Association. The library is an open sanctuary. It is devoted to individual intellectual inquiry and contemplation. Uh, its function is to provide free access to ideas and information. It is a haven for privacy, a source of both cultural and intellectual sustenance for the individual reader. Uh, and so I think that this really kind of drives home the point of why privacy is important for librarians. Um, and I think a lot, most librarians actually understand this. It's you know, not a controversial idea. Um, it's something that is expected as a librarian when you're going into the profession. Uh, next slide. Um, also, libraries are really seen as these sanctuaries. Um, whether it's actually true or not, um, most people go into libraries and they kind of feel this sol uh, solace. They actually feel like they're being protected in some uh, degree uh, from the outside world. Uh, and um, they can kind of uh, pursue their intellectual um, freedom and, and desires in a way that's in a protected way, in a way that's free. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, libraries are kind of seen as these sanctuaries. Um, to bring it to the current day, uh, they're seen as sanctuaries, especially for uh, at-risk communities. Next slide. Uh, but why security? Uh, why is security important uh, as well? Next slide. Well, to answer that question, we need to take a detour through the Internet. Uh, next slide. Yes, the Internet. Next slide. Um, so when most people think about the Internet, they think of um, an email, and they send an email. And so we have these two figures, Alice and Bob. And Alice wants to send an email to Bob. Next slide. And it looks like, from Alice's perspective, that that email is going directly to the inbox of Bob. Next slide. But in actuality, uh, there are a number of intermediaries between the connection of Alice and Bob. Uh, primarily the email service providers and the Internet service providers. Next slide. Uh, and also three-letter agencies such as the NSA um, that has control uh, or has special hardware that they can install uh, on backbone and privileged network nodes. Next slide. Uh, so you know, uh, in addition, you also have eavesdroppers, which can possibly uh, be snooping on the connection either in the home or cafe that Alice is connecting from, or in uh, Bob's home or cafe or uh, wherever they're connecting from. Next slide. With the help of next slide encryption. Uh, we can actually make this connection uh, much more secure, and that people can actually uh, be ensured that the communications that they're, that they're uh, sending are not interceptable and not readable. Next slide. What is encryption? Well, encryption scrambles the message content um, so that it's not readable uh, from anyone that's sitting on the network uh, in the middle of Alice and Bob. It also, uh, to note, still has metadata. Um, that's everything that isn't the direct contents of that message. Um, so next slide. What is metadata? Next slide. Um, in this example, 
Metadata is the time that that email is sent, the subject line, uh, the time received, um, you know, the name of the sender, the name of the recipient. All that data is still accessible even if encryption is used. Next slide. Uh, so for HTTPS, HTTPS is basically web encryption. Uh, and the contents uh, for HTTPS, what's actually encrypted um, is what exact page you're accessing. For instance, um, if you are accessing example.com slash some path, the some path part of that URL, of that website, that's the encrypted part. The username and password, if you're logging into a site, that's also encrypted uh, if you're using HTTPS. And also, if you're logging into a session, uh, say Facebook.com, if you're posting content, that's also encrypted. What's not encrypted is the metadata. Uh, what domain you're on, uh, for instance, if you're on Bing.com, that's not encrypted. That can be seen. Uh, what time you accessed it, and your location data, uh, for instance, your IP address. Um, and uh, you know, so your IP address is this unique identifier that's linked to your location. Um, so you can see here by this graph, in the first instance, uh, next slide, um, what is, what is uh, encrypted and what's, uh, what's you know, plainly visible from, uh, from HTTPS and non-HTTPS connections. Um, next slide. Uh, here you can see that you know, there's this green lock, uh, and that indicates that you're actually using an HTTPS connection. Um, and that, that way you can be ensured that your connection on the web is encrypted. Next slide. Uh, we develop at EFF a product called HTTPS Everywhere. And what this does is it ensures that if a website offers HTTPS uh, and an unencrypted connection, that you're actually using the encrypted connection to that website. You're actually using the best security for that website that is available. Next slide. Uh, this is a, a downloadable browser extension that's available for both Firefox and Chrome. Um, and uh, you can install it on both your own computer and also the patrons' computers um, that are public stations uh, at your library. Next slide. Um, so why is security important um, for librarians? This article uh, by the American Libraries Magazine kind of drives home why it's important and also some of the failures of libraries to actually deploy good HTTPS. Next slide. Their findings are that without encryption, the content that the patrons search for, view, or download is easily intercepted. These online streams of communication deserve the same protections granted to circulation records, but few libraries are taking even minimal steps to encrypt this data. Um, so you can see that you know, this is uh, something, you know, the encryption, uh, HTTPS specifically, is something that really um, is important uh, for, for, you know, and it should be granted the same kind of level as circulation records. Next slide. Um, their findings continue that out of the top 124 uh, uh, American research libraries, only 13% of them are actually using HTTPS. Next uh, bullet point. Uh, and out of the 25 largest public libraries um, that they surveyed, only two of them, 8%, were using HTTPS on their main websites, and uh, only 28% uh, default to HTTPS for search activity. Next slide. So they conclude that we could better attribute this, uh, lap and, uh, this gap in uh, deploying HTTPS uh, to an awareness or lack of expertise in reconfiguring implementations, which basically means that there's not enough staff and there's not enough um, people with a skill level uh, to really make it um, viable for these libraries to deploy HTTPS. Next slide. This is really troubling. Next slide. Um, so why is it troubling? Who cares if HTTPS is on sites? Next slide. Well, we know that the NSA is compromising cloud services. This slide um, was revealed in the Snowden revelations. Um, and what it shows 
is that the NSA is actually intercepting the background communications um, of Google and uh, trying to siphon off data of users of Google services. Next slide. We know that the NSA is undermining encryption. Uh, they have, for instance, paid $10 million to, to RSA to uh, essentially privilege a weakened uh, encryption, what's called a cipher, which is a way that encryption is performed, um, and, uh, and privilege that in, their, in the uh, cipher suite that, NSA, that, um, that, sorry, that RSA provides. Next slide. So we know that the FBI has amended patron records as well. Um, this uh, is a case where in, uh, in Connecticut, the libraries uh, were, uh, their service providers were basically issued national security letters. The ACLU challenged that. Uh, and that's why we're able to talk about it, because national security letters um, under the Patriot Act are, uh, are accompanied by gag orders, so you can't even talk about them unless, uh, unless you uh, are combating and, and winning those cases. So you know, this is something that's really troubling, that patron records are actually being requested by, uh, by the government, by the FBI in this case. Next slide, and they're being requested over, next slide, and over again. Uh, these two cases uh, were brought against um, the FBI demanded records um, of the Internet Archive, which is a digital, uh, online digital archive. Um, and what they were doing was they were saying, in 2007, we want your records. Uh, EFF challenged that, and uh, we were able to talk about it in 2007. The latest case in 2016, just last year, um, the NSL was accompanied by information that um, instructed how to challenge the NSL, but that was faulty information. Uh, they were giving out information how to challenge the NSL that was actually uh, that was actually erroneous, so um, and misleading, and so we challenged that and got them to to stop that as well. Next slide. So why aren't more libraries uh, websites offering HTTPS? Well, traditionally, uh, obtaining a certificate uh, which you need to provide HTTPS is pretty hard. Uh, and installing that HTTPS certificate once you get it is also really hard. Next slide. So why, um, you know, HTTPS certificates also cost money. Um, they have traditionally not been free. Uh, and there's no reason why um, security should be anything but free. For cert the certificate authorities, which issue uh, HTTPS certificates, this, these are automated systems that cost pennies um, to, to, to you know, issue a single certificate. And there's no reason why um, they should cost $10 a pop for uh, every website that you want to encrypt. Next slide. Well, introducing CertBot. Next slide. CertBot is a pro uh, project of the Electronic Frontier Foundation um, in collaboration with uh, other organizations. Uh, and what it does is it bullet point automatically issues HTTPS certificates um, at bullet point and configures your software to use them so it's not actually hard to deploy bullet point for free. Uh, next slide. So it's important to note here that HTTPS provides security but does not protect privacy. Next slide. Your data is big money. Um, this is a graphic that shows when you access the New York Times where your data is actually being delivered. It doesn't just go to the New York Times. It goes to dozens of other organizations. Um, and that's because uh, when you access the New York Times, um, it's pulling in resources from other organizations, maybe ad networks, uh, maybe you know, fonts that are included in other um, places that New York Times itself doesn't host. So these are actually um, all places where your data is being delivered when you access uh, the New York, New York Times website. Next slide. And that's delivered to, bullet point, advertisers to market your products at you. Um, for instance, there have been uh, notable instances of differential pricing. If you live closer to a Walmart, for instance, then uh, a, a, a website that's trying to sell you things that are also available at that Walmart 
um, will have a lower price than if you live very far from a Walmart. Um, and there's also these diploma mills which market typically at low income uh, uh, people uh, to attend universities that grant diplomas that aren't really worth the paper they're printed on. Um, so bullet point, uh, web trackers also do big data analysis on you and they do that without your consent. No one actually um, is displayed uh, a warning that's saying, hey, look, your data is going um, you know, to X, Y, and Z. Uh, places, there, there are regulations in the European Union, but um, not here. Um, there's not a, any federal data protection uh, regime in the US. Next bullet point, or sorry, uh, next slide. Um, so there is this August 2016 study of web trackers, next slide, uh, and they found that bullet point, at least 75% of the top 500 internet sites contain trackers. And this is up from bullet point, uh, less than 5% in 1998. So we've seen a real, real increase in the amount of sites that are actually performing web tracking that are, that are siphoning off your data as you browse the web. Uh, bullet, uh, uh, next slide. The findings continue that the number of trackers have increased, uh, as well as the ability of the trackers to actually um, employ technologies that track you and the complexity of those trackers. Um, this is all kind of increased, uh, and this is a really troubling, uh, troubling dynamic. Uh, next slide. So enter Privacy Badger. Next slide. Privacy Badger is a extension that's developed uh, at EFF. It's also uh, like HTTPS everywhere, a downloadable browser extension um, that's available for Firefox and Chrome browser. Um, and what it does, next slide, is bullet point. It tells uh, sites that you do not wish to be tracked. Bullet point. It looks for third parties as you browse the web and bullet point. If a third party is seen on several different domains, bullet point, and it appears to be tracking you, bullet point, then it gets blocked. Um, so it looks for these different tracking mechanisms that trackers use, and it tries to determine if it's a tracker or not that's doing it, and it blocks them if it is. Next slide. This is Privacy Badger in action. Uh, you can see um, that some websites are blocked because they look like trackers and other websites are allowed. Next slide. So what this you know, all really comes down to is a question of user education. Unfortunately, um, you know, users aren't really aware of what is happening with their data, bullet point. Generally, users don't really know the risks to their privacy and security when they browse the web, uh, when they access the internet. Bullet point, uh, there are often vested interests that are actively trying to subvert knowledge about how users can protect themselves. I mean, in the case of HTTPS, it might be a government, but in the case of you know, private uh, browsing with privacy, um, then it's you know, these trackers or ad agencies. Uh, bullet point, and there's this difficult task of actually raising awareness um, and letting users know that their privacy is at risk. So what librarians can do is they can kind of let their patrons know about these risks, um, perhaps the home page for their public uh, computers can be something that includes text about how their privacy is being affected. Um, next slide. Uh, and you know, one of our resources at EFF is uh, uh, ssd.eff.org, which is the last resource here. And that explains a lot more info about how users can protect themselves and how you can help your patrons know uh, and yourself get informed about these risks. Um, and I also have the resources here uh, for additional information uh, in the presentation. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Bill. And thanks for bearing with us with those technical difficulties. I think we got through everything okay. So um, uh, thanks for 
uh, uh, working with me on that. Um, uh, we've got some great questions that have come in. And uh, before we get to those, I just want to say thanks for sharing all of this. I mean this is an information-rich presentation that you've just given with lots of links and lots, lots of resources. And I just want to remind everyone who's joined us that we are going to be sharing those links in the archive. And I know there were lots of articles um, that were referenced, and those will also be included. So you can go and follow up with those uh, later on. Later on. Uh, we did get one question about sharing the name of that study. And I think I, I think I know which one this is, and I'm just going to go back to it. Um, uh, well, and actually I'll see if I can find it in a moment, and we'll go back to that one that had this the study. Um, but Bill, we've been getting some uh, good questions um, from participants, and so I'm going to go through as many as we can in the few minutes we have before Chuck's presentation. Um, and one of those questions is, does CertBot rely on the Let's Encrypt certificates? Um, and could you talk a little bit more about that? Right. So CertBot is um, what's called the client side of the dynamic duo of Let's Encrypt and, and, uh, and CertBot. So the Let's Encrypt is what's called the server side. Um, so Let's Encrypt acts as the issuing body. Um, Let's Encrypt uh, software runs on not your own computer that you want to get you know, a certificate for a website that you own, but it runs um, as, uh, as the issuer uh, on the Internet so that you request certificates from it. So Let's Encrypt is you know, uh, basically, um, yeah, Let's Encrypt works with CertBot to issue certificates, um, and they're kind of part and parcel of the same uh, overall thing. Great. Um, and another related question, and I think that you answered this. It came in early on, but I want to make sure we get this really clear. Um, is there a cost to going to HTTPS versus HTTP? And I think you shared an option with us, with us that was uh, either free or very low cost. Right. So with CertBot, if you download CertBot, um, and uh, the link uh, I have at the end of my presentation, has where you can actually download a CertBot software. Um, that's absolutely free. There's no cost for HTTPS uh, deployment, um, you know, other than the cost that it takes to have a system then run um, this software. And traditionally, that's been a very high bar. Um, the you know system mins that wanted to deploy certificates, um, it took them, you know, and it took actually. Uh, security uh, re uh, researchers and experts uh, hours often to get it right. Uh, and what CertBot does is it takes on a very hands-on approach and deploys the certificates for you. So you don't have to worry about all the configuration options. Great. Um, now we have a question about HTTPS Everywhere. Um, what browsers um, does that work for? And I'm just going to go back to the slide where we talked about that. Sure. Um, so HTTPS Everywhere is what I do at EFF. Um, it's my, uh, it's my uh, primary uh, job at EFF is to maintain that browser extension. Um, currently it is supported uh, in Firefox and uh, in Chrome browser, also in Chromium if you use Chromium, which is a, the free version uh, of – or free as um, – free, free uh, uh, software version of Chrome browser, and also in Opera browser if you use that. Great. Uh, and then oh gosh, I'm just trying to go through a couple of the quick questions here. We've got some big questions which we'll try to save for later on once we've heard from Chuck as well. Um, but a question about Privacy Badger. Is Privacy Badger free? Privacy Badger, uh, yes. All the, all the tools to protect your users that I've listened to this presentation are absolutely free. So Great. SearchBot is free, and uh, so is uh, HTTPS Everywhere and Privacy Badger. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. I know we kind of went through each one individually as those questions came in. Um, and then uh, we've got a question um, about the difference between um, the browser option to deny tracking and Privacy Badger. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. And that, this might be our last question before we move on. Sure. So what browsers are they doing uh, early – I believe it's either early this decade or last decade – is they started um, delivering this little flag to websites that you access that says that you do not wish to be tracked. Um, and that's something that uh, is great, but it also isn't really enforceable. We send it 
with Privacy Badger, we actually set that flag to say, hey, browser, you should uh, send this to websites that I'm accessing that I you know, do not consent to being tracked. But it's not um, an enforceable mechanism. That's called do not track, the do, the do not track flag. There's also do not track policy that is different that we at EFF have formulated. Um, and that is something that, that says that if browser, I mean, if websites uh, say that they are not going to track users, promise not to track users, and post a policy, privacy policy, um, that, is, that, that actually puts in writing that, that's, uh, that effect, that they're, that they're not going to track those users, then um, with Privacy Badger, uh, we will selectively unblock those sites. Um, that, that, that have that good privacy policy that I promise not to track users. So yeah, it's a little bit tricky, but so there's the do not track policy and the do not track flag. Um, yeah. Great. Well, thanks for clarifying the difference between those. Um, I'm just going to get back to uh, this slide one last time to, to um, let everybody know that we, I know we had some other questions come in and we haven't had a chance to get to all of them. Uh, we'll try to bring Bill back at the end to answer a few more of your questions. And we will follow up via email with anything that um, we weren't able to answer live today. So don't be discouraged if you ask a question we haven't gotten to it yet. We'll have other opportunities to do that. Uh, but we have another guest and we want to hear from him as well. So uh, at this point I want to welcome Chuck again joining us from the Lebanon Public Libraries in New Hampshire. And Chuck is going to talk to us about what he has done in his library. So Chuck, I'll hand it over to you now. And, uh, and let me know if you need me to advance your slides. I understand you're having the same technical issue. Thanks, Crystal. So my name is Chuck McAndrew. I'm the IT librarian at the Lebanon Public Libraries in Lebanon, New Hampshire. And um, Bill gave you a really good overview of the higher level stuff, the way that traffic goes over the Internet. And um, so what I wanted to do today is uh, give some practical tips, something you can take home and implement in your library right now or uh, today. And um, it's stuff that we've done in our library and we found uh, worked well. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to add a plug for HD, or for um, uh, CertBot. That's what we use in our library. It is very good. And not only that, uh, I've also um, pushed our ILS vendor to implement it. And uh, they recently announced they're putting it in place for all their uh, customers, so all their customers now will have HTTPS by default because of CertBot. It's very easy to use. So, um, go ahead and uh, next slide, please, Crystal. So I am from the Lebanon Public Libraries. Uh, we're about halfway up uh, the state of New Hampshire, uh, right on the Vermont border. We're kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we think we're a big library for the area. We have about 14,000 people, which is big for the area, but I know nationally that's not too huge. Uh, but we do a lot for uh, privacy, patron privacy in our library, and if we can do it, so can you. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the first thing I want to talk about is Wi-Fi, because a lot of times you see uh, open Wi-Fi in libraries, and that's fine, but there are some things you should be aware of when you have open Wi-Fi. So open Wi-Fi is the best for convenience. People can just walk in and click on the Wi-Fi and don't need to worry about a password uh, or anything. And it, uh, it actually promotes access in that when the library is closed or someone doesn't even want to come through the doors of the library, they can use that Wi-Fi. But it's unencrypted. Uh, so the connection between the computer and the wireless access point is not encrypted, which potentially allows for snooping and man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, and a man-in-the-middle attack is where uh, someone else pretends to be the website that you're, that you're trying to connect to. Now, if you have an end-to-end -end encryption uh, system in place like HTTPS, this is not a huge deal. But uh, if you're connecting to an unencrypted connection, then basically anyone on that network can see everything you do. Um, so essentially what we're doing by having open Wi-Fi is we're placing the responsibility for security on the patron rather than on the library. Uh, most of our patrons in our library are not extremely tech savvy, so the more we can do to help them out with privacy and the more we can do to build secure private systems that they can use, the better we're doing as librarians. Next slide, please. 
So an alternative is to have secured Wi-Fi. This is Wi-Fi with a password. Um, the pros is it's an encrypted connection. It is the best for privacy and security. Uh, it can limit access though, and it's not as convenient. Um, just as a note, please don't use WEP encryption. Only use WPA2. WEP is broken. You can crack it really quickly with just a normal laptop. Um, now you can try publicly posting the uh, password. You'll see this a lot of times like in coffee shops and stuff. And that is one way to reduce the uh, convenience concerns here. Uh, but uh, it doesn't allow that 24-hour access to your library, uh, Wi-Fi and stuff, which to me is actually a big service. I know uh, there have been times when I've traveled on road trips and stuff, and I've been able to pull, pull into a library's parking lot and use their Wi-Fi even when they're closed, and that's, that was hugely handy. Uh, next slide, please. So there's compromises. One is to have both a secured and an open network, and the other compromise is to broadcast a secured network with the password in the name. At our library, we do both. This is actually a screenshot from my laptop of our library, uh, library Wi-Fi networks. So we have library guest, which is unsecured. It's open, and anyone can use it. And then we have library guest password is Leb library. And that is just what it sounds like. It's a guest network with the password right in the name. So anyone looking at that knows what the password is. And then we have library staff, because you should never have your library staff using the same network as your library guests, which um, gets more into the infrastructure side of things. But this is a big problem that I see with a lot of libraries. You really want to segregate that out because the library staff is dealing with a lot of sensitive patron data that is protected by law in most cases. And so you don't want to have random people uh, able to snoop on your staff network. Uh, next slide, please. So those are kind of uh, some of the considerations that go into Wi-Fi selection. Uh, you can see we hedged our bets and did all of the above. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, public computers and how we can protect patrons' privacies using our public computers. Um, this is not exhaustive. I teach an uh, online privacy course at my library. It's uh, two hours sessions, and there's five sessions in the course, and I consider that kind of just an introduction. So a, uh, 30 minutes of talking on a webinar is not enough to go into this. So these are just uh, what I would consider very basic things that uh, everyone should be implementing. Uh, I'll also note that in the uh, links we've included at the end of this uh, presentation, uh, the American Library Association has recently released some checklists of things that libraries should be doing. Uh, take a look at those checklists and run through them for your library. They're very good and they're much more exhaustive than this. So public computers, keep them up to date. This is the number one thing you can do for security on your computers at home, your patron computers, your staff computers, any computers. Most exploits, most hacks are on vulnerabilities that have already been fixed. Uh, Software companies these days are actually pretty good about getting fixes out pretty quickly, and a lot of security researchers will notify the software company about a vulnerability before they release it publicly. So, but the software companies, all they can do is release the fix. If you don't update, then that's actually on you. You also want to make sure your rollback software doesn't roll back your updates. So if you're using something like Deep Freeze, you have to make sure it unfreezes for updates. Otherwise, you can install your updates, but it's going to roll them back. Um, Automatically installing security updates is a very good thing because it makes sure they get done. You don't have to add it to your schedule. It's not another thing you have to do. There's a little bit of potential for breaking something with automatic updates, but most people in libraries who I've seen don't go to the trouble of testing updates before they apply them anyway, so you might as well have them automatically installed. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next thing, and this is very important for public privacy, not in the sense that someone's going to be snooping over at, uh, on them over the Internet, but in the sense that the next person who sits down at the computer after them might see something. Restore your computers to a known good state between patrons. I've gone in libraries and seen credit card applications saved on those computers. Uh, you have to wipe out everything the patron does between users. Otherwise, 
it doesn't matter whether you have the most secure connection in the world. The next person who sits down can see everything they did. Um, so if you're using uh, like Windows computers, having some kind of rollback software such as DeepFreeze, DeepFreeze is just the one I've heard of the most, uh, is really important. If you're using something like uh, Chromebooks or Chromeboxes, Chrome OS, this actually comes built into it. You just uh, need a Google domain and you use public sessions. If um, you're doing something oddball like we do at my library and you're using an open source operating system like Linux, then uh, there's actually a uh, script that I wrote that uh, accomplishes this. But regardless of what system you're using, uh, it can be done on all of them. Just make sure that you have a uh, strategy for ensuring that every patient who sits down has a known good uh, situation. This also prevents uh, tampering with the system, like installing malicious software such as key loggers. There was an article that came out last year about a university library where uh, there were some, I think it was 30 or 40 key loggers <laughs> installed on uh, library computers. So everything that anyone was sitting down and typing into those computers was logged. Uh, if, you're if you're restoring this uh, system to a known good state and a uh, patrons don't have administrator privileges, which is another important point, uh, then anything malicious they try to do should be undone. Uh, next slide, please. There's also a lot of uh, tweaks you can make to your browser settings. Uh, this example that I have up here is from uh, Google Chrome, but the same, all the major browsers allow this. Uh, have either have the browser not remember history or open in incognito mode. And what that does is it ensures that nothing is retained between browse, browser sessions. So even if the patron doesn't log out, as long as they close that browser window, then it's not going to remember uh, stuff on the browser window. Now that doesn't help if they download something, but it, it's a good step. And you may say, well, I have this rollback software, uh, so I don't need to do this. The fact is that None of these are perfect solutions, so having a defense in depth where you have multiple layers of security is the way to go. So um, have it not remember history. Do not have it remember form data. Definitely do not have it remember passwords. Um, and more on the Internet privacy side of things, set your plugins to click to play. This ensures that plugins uh, like the Flash Player uh, don't just start up and run. Uh, when you go to a website, because those are essentially little programs running inside your web browser. Uh, so you want the patron to have control over whether that uh, runs or not. And finally, disable third-party cookies. Um, all this is done through the settings. The details of it vary by which browser. So uh, just do a quick online search for all of these for whatever your browser of choice is, and you, you can figure out how to do it. Next slide, please. Um, so Bill talked about uh, two of the three uh, plugins that we install on all our public computers already, HTTPS Everywhere and Privacy Badger, both very good plugins. And like I say, I put them on all my public computers. And uh, then the third one I install is uBlock Origin. And what uBlock Origin is, it's a ad blocker. Um, now there's some debate about ad blockers because a lot of sites on the Internet use ad revenue to keep going. And there's, some people feel that there's kind of an implicit contract. You go to the site, you utilize their services, and you don't pay anything. You should look at their ads. And I can certainly understand that. I have a lot of sympathy for that. However, um, the problem is that it's not just that ads are annoying. Ads are frequently malicious. And this is even true or especially true on big, well-known websites. Uh, these websites do not have the time, money, or staff to really vet every ad. So what they do is they contract it out to third-party advertising companies. And all of the major websites have had cases of malicious advertising showing up on their website. Now malicious advertising means that if you click on that ad, it will do something malicious to your computer. Um, so until they figure out a better way to ensure that their ads are actually safe, I think that it is uh, just common sense that anyone going on the Internet 
does in fact block ads by default. Now, at uBlock Origin provides a very easy way to disable it if you do want to see ads on a site or if it's necessary to see ads for the site to work properly. Uh, just like Privacy Badger and HTTPS everywhere are very easy to disable. Um, some of these may interfere with the functionality of some websites. And that's actually okay in my view because often the functionality they're interfering with is not functionality you want. It doesn't benefit your patrons. But there are times when uh, it will prevent them, the patron from doing what they want. So it's important that your staff know how to disable them. So if a website's not working properly, you can try disabling it. But we want on by default. We want safe by default. Um, to ensure that our patrons, uh, when they sit down at the library, we, we can't guarantee they have a completely safe or completely private experience, but what we can do is we can take care of the low-hanging fruit. We can uh, take care of the easy stuff. If someone's being tracked by the NSA, probably not much we do on our public computers is going to help them, but we can prevent the you know script kiddies from being able to figure out what they're doing. Next slide, please. And the final thing I would say for public computers is install the Tor browser. Um, so if you aren't familiar with Tor, what Tor is, it's a strong anonymity product. Uh, and what it does is it encrypts your traffic and it severs the link between the sender and the receiver. So it does this by bouncing it through three voluntarily operated relays. Um, your computer will connect to what's called a guard relay. And then the guard relay will bounce it to a middle relay. The middle relay has no idea who you are or where the traffic came from. It has no idea where the traffic's going. All it knows is the two other relays it's talking to. The traffic is then sent to what's known as an exit relay, which is what goes out and talks to the website. The website sees this traffic as coming from the exit relay rather than from your computer. Um, Tor also will create a new circuit for every separate domain and every separate tab within the browser. So that means if you're on Twitter and on Google in two separate tabs, Twitter may think you're connecting from the Netherlands and Google may think you're connecting from Canada. This prevents cross-site tracking, which uh, Bill talked about a little bit earlier, which is becoming more and more of an issue. Uh, these trackers, because so many sites have them, they'll follow you across sites, which can give them a whole lot of uh, insight into your behavior that you may not want them to have. So the Tor browser is basically a modified version of Firefox that runs everything through the Tor network. By providing, and again, this is a screenshot from our public computers at our library. By providing access to the Tor browser, you're giving your patrons strong privacy and anonymity, uh, but you're not requiring it. You still offer the other browsers. You're just giving them the option. Now, some libraries may have issue with this if they're required to filter their internet. Um, so uh, one solution that we've kind of come up with when talking to people who were in that situation is you can actually install the Tor browser to a thumb drive. You don't have to install it to the computer. You can put it on a thumb drive and it will run just fine. So you can put the Tor browser on thumb drives and make that available to patrons. That will allow you to still filter your internet but have the possibility of using the Tor browser for patrons who want it and who aren't subject to filtering like adults. So, I would recommend that every library have the Tor browser available to their patrons. It is free. It runs on every, opera every major operating system. Uh, and it's relatively easy to use. Not only are you offering the technical benefits of uh, the encryption and the anonymity, but it's also a great way to, raise, uh, to start conversations about digital privacy. Uh, once we installed it on our computers and put up signs explaining what it is, I've had a lot of patrons come up and start talking to me about these issues. And it's a great way to start an education uh, initiative with patrons. Once uh, they started talking about that, they started asking for classes on how to stay safer online. And uh, that led to our uh, we call it online self-defense, which I shamelessly stole from the EFF with their surveillance self-defense because I thought it was such a cool name. Uh, and you can see the link on the slide there, uh, leblibrary.com 
slash online dash self dash defense. That's my entire curriculum. Um, and you can download the slides and all my notes. Feel free to use it in your library, by the way. Um, and there's the ALA Privacy Checklist, the Library Freedom Project. If you don't know about Library Freedom Project, Allison Macrina is awesome, and she will come to your area and teach you how to do all this stuff. Uh, San Jose Public uh, has an awesome privacy program as well, as well as the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So that is all I have today. All right, uh, Chuck, thank you uh, for, again, a very information-rich presentation. And again, just to let everybody know, we are going to share the slides and all of these links in the archive, and you will get that in the email, um, in your email that you use to register for this webinar. Uh, so that will be coming uh, within a few days. Um, now we've gotten a lot of questions, Chuck. People want to know more details about some of the things you're doing. So I'm going to see how many of these we can get to in the short period of time uh, that we have. And I know uh, Bill's been responding to some of those extra questions in chat, so we'll let him keep working on that. And if we have time, we'll bring him back. Um, but we got some questions just to go back to what you were talking about early on with the Wi-Fi network. Um, we got one question that said, uh, and, and I think this is a good one. So when you broadcast your password, as you showed over the um, uh, Wi-Fi network, ca uh, can't you still get uh, man-in-the-middle MITM attacks? And I'm just uh, going to go back to the slide where you talked about this. That's a good question, and the answer is no. Um, because uh, the password is not the important part. The encryption is the important part. So the secured network basically creates an encrypted connection between the wireless access point and the computer. Um, the password is not the encryption key. Uh, so each individual client, each individual computer will have its own one-time use encryption key that secures that session. So every time you connect, it basically generates a new encryption key. And that's what prevents the snooping, and that's what prevents the, uh, the um, man-in-the-middle attack. It's uh, basically the same thing that's going on with HTTPS. Great. And we got another question, and I, I feel like the answer may be similar, but correct me if I'm wrong. So on Wi-Fi, if everyone shares the same login, can they use that to decrypt all the traffic? If we all have the same password, do we all have the same key? Uh, and the answer is no, you don't have the same key. Uh, so the password is just essentially to authenticate yourself to the network, but then uh, it, your computer and the wireless access point negotiate a, uh, a key. Uh, if you if you want to know more about how the encryption works, uh, the Khan Academy has an excellent uh, series on YouTube. It's called Gambling with Secrets. I haven't included that link, but I can find it real quick. Um, and it, ta it it is really great for uh, understanding how encryption works, uh, including these: how do you negotiate a key with, without having a shared key to start with? Um, Great. So. And Chuck, if you share that with me, um, then we'll try to include that in the archives. So yeah, that would be a great additional resource to add. All right, uh, we got a question. Now moving on to the um, uh, restoring the PCs to their known good state. And uh, someone said to restore that to, 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 to restore our public PCs to a known good state requires a reboot. So would rebooting so often decrease the life of the PC? It should not. It especially wouldn't if you had a solid state hard drive. Um, but no, it, it should not uh, significantly impact the, uh, the life of the computer. Great. And uh, of course, many of the things that you're talking about here are um, related to kind of the back-end IT function of the computers. And so um, you know, you do a lot of that in-house as your role as IT librarian. But we got a question for those who maybe don't have that same relationship with their IT department. Uh, all of our computers are maintained through the ID, IT department at the city, and we don't have a lot of control over these issues. So do you have any suggestions for how to convince the city of the importance? Uh, so that is actually where my library was a few years ago, and um, they hired an IT librarian specifically to change that. So that is one option, is to bring it in-house. Um, a lot of IT departments, uh, especially um, like 
municipal IT departments don't really have a good understanding about the IT needs of librarians or libraries, uh, because what we do tends to be very different than what other city departments do. So you either need to be able to uh, communicate with the IT department in a way they understand your needs, which of course involves understanding your IT needs. So you need a base level of understanding yourself so you can talk to them and communicate, or you need to train or hire someone on staff who has this understanding and either can do it themselves or can communicate. So uh, it will involve either staff training, uh, professional development, or it will involve um, actually hiring someone who already has those skills. But I would say if you look at what public libraries especially do today, the technology side is as important as books are, if not much more important. Um, and we never think twice about hiring a cataloger or hiring someone to do collection development. Um, but we, a lot of libraries bulk at hiring someone with IT skills. And I think that just needs to change in libraries. This is a mindset that uh, hasn't kept up with the reality of what we do. All right. Um, Great. Thanks for answering that question. Now we're still getting a lot of good questions coming in, and I want to just assure everybody that if we don't have time for them today, we'll get to them via email later on. Um, but I have one last question. Actually, this came on early on, and uh, Chuck, I'm going to have you uh, answer it first. And then Bill, if you have any last comments, we'll have time for that as well, just a minute or two, uh, whether it's to answer this question or just to add anything else in. Um, but this question actually gets a little bit at um, some of the – and we didn't talk about this a whole lot, but about the concept of collecting library patron data um, that they, you know, whether this is from uh, the ILS or the public computers, um, the types of data you might be collecting to make uh, customer service decisions um, and to market services better to patrons. And uh, Chuck, I don't know if in your library you had any conversations around this, but it certainly revolves around this patron privacy issues. So uh, Chuck, if you have uh, just some brief words on that to share from your perspective in the IT or your perspective as a librarian, and then we'll bounce it over to Bill. Sure. Uh, first I would say uh, check your local laws because every state has patron privacy laws uh, regarding what uh, library information can and cannot be used for what purposes. Um, now using uh, – so like using patron information to better market your uh, your library services, I would say typically what we would look for is just making it an opt-in rather than an opt-out. That is, you don't just send out mass emails to everyone in your uh, who has a library card, uh, but you can ask them when they sign up for a card, would you like to be included in our emails. Uh, our children's librarian actually collects email addresses from parents when, uh, so she can let them know about upcoming children's events. And that's an opt-in model. And I think that's perfectly fine because that's patrons actually saying, yes, we would like to participate in this. Yes, we would like to have uh, our information used for these purposes. And you also have to have a good well thought out privacy policy saying what you will and will not use the information for and make sure you're, you hold yourself and your staff to it. Great. And, uh, and uh, just one more uh, bit from Chuck. That was a uh, thank you for sharing your perspective on that from your library. Uh, this is also something that is included in the American Library Association statements on patron privacy and collection of patron data. And those are links we'll also be sharing in the archives. And it's a part of the, the new checklist that we talked about as well. Um, so, so it is included, the recommendations from the American Library Association and uh, LIDA are, in, are going to be included in the archive. Um, Bill, we have just one minute if you're still on the line and you have any last words you want to share, whether it's on that question or something else, uh, uh, come on and, and let us know. Yeah, I mean the only other thing that I'd add to that, and Chuck really um, did uh, that question due diligence, is, is uh, to uh, make sure that the patrons themselves are aware of um, any information that they're giving out and um, have links to learn more. Um, you know, user education, again, is really important. And if the patrons don't know where that information is being delivered and how it's being dealt with, then they can't really have uh, any objective assessment of whether or not they'd like to opt in or opt out. 
Great. All right. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you, Chuck, for sharing all of this today. I'm afraid that's all that we have time for, but it sure has been an information-rich hour. We'll follow up on those unanswered questions uh, soon via email. Mm -hmm. I did want to let you all know about some upcoming webinars that might be of interest, including uh, one on the 28th of March about technology donations through TechSoup, uh, one on dis disaster prep and recovery on April 4th, and one on digital storytelling for libraries on April 26th. Save the date for that one. Uh, also, please visit us at TechSoupForLibraries.org where we've got blog posts and webinar archives and all sorts of other information that is library specific for you. And uh, that's all. We just want to give one last word of thanks to ReadyTalk, our webinar sponsor for today. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Have a great day.